Of course, I don't assert that he had never suffered for his convictions at all, but I'm fully convinced that he might have gone and lecturing on his Arabs as long as he liked, if he had only given the necessary explanations. But he was too lofty, and he proceeded with peculiar haste to assure himself that his career was ruined forever by the vortex of circumstance. And if the whole truth is to be told, the real cause of the change in his career was the very delicate proposition which had been made before and was then renewed by Varvara Petrovna Stavrogin, lady of great wealth, the wife of the lieutenant general, that he should undertake the education and the whole intellectual development of her only son in the capacity of superior sort of teacher and friend, to say nothing of a magnificent salary. This proposal had been made to him the first time in Berlin, at the moment when he was first left a widow. His first wife was a frivolous girl from our province, whom he married in his early and I'm thinking youth, and apparently he had had a great deal of trouble with this young person, charming as she was, owing to the lack of means for her support, and also from other more delicate reasons. She died in Paris, after three years separation from him, leaving him a son of five years old, the fruit of our first joyous and unclouded love, or the words the sorrowing father once let fall in my presence. The child had from the first been sent back to Russia, where he was brought up in the charge of distant cousins in some remote region, Stepan Trofimovich had declined Vavai Petrovna's proposal on that occasion and had quickly married again before the year was over, a taciturn Berlin girl, and what makes it more strange, there was no particular necessity for him to do so. But apart from his marriage, there were, it appears, other reasons for his decline in the situation. He was tempted by the resounding fame of a professor, celebrated at that time, and he in his turn hastened to the lecturer's chair, for which he had been preparing himself to try his eagle wings in flight. But now, with singed wings, he naturally remembered the proposition which even then had made him hesitate. The sudden death of his second wife, who didn't live a year with him, settled the matter decisively. To put it plainly, it was all brought about by the passion of sympathy and priceless, so to speak, classic friendship of Varvara Petrovna, if one may use such an expression of friendship. He flung himself into the arms of his friendship, and his position was settled for more than twenty years. I use this expression flung himself into the arms of, but God forbid that anyone should fly to idle and superfluous conclusions. These embraces must be understood only in the most loftily moral sense, the most refined and delicate tie united these two beings, both so remarkable, forever. The post of tutor was the more readily accepted, too, as the property, a very small one, left to Stepan Trofimovich by his first wife, was close to Skvarishniki, Stavrogin's magnificent estate on the outskirts of our provincial town. Besides, in the stillness of his study, far from the immense burden of university work, it was always possible to devote himself to the service of science and to enrich the literature of his country with erudite studies. These works didn't appear, but, on the other hand, it did appear possible to spend the rest of his life, more than twenty years, a reproach incarnate, so to speak, to his native country, in the words of a popular report, reproach incarnate thou didst stand direct before thy fatherland, O liberal idealist. But the persons to whom the popular poet referred may perhaps have had the right to adopt this post for the rest of his life if he had wished to do so, though it must have been tedious. Our step on Trofimovich was to tell the truth only an imitator compared with such people. Moreover, he had grown very of standing and react and often lay down for a while, but to do him justice the incarnation of reproach was preserved even a recumbent attitude, the more so as that was quite sufficient for the province. You should have seen him at our club, when he sat down to cards. His whole figure seemed to exclaim, Cards, me sit down to whist with you. Is it consistent? Who's responsible for it? Who has shattered my energies and turned them to whist? Perish Russia, and he would majestically trump with the heart. And to tell the truth, he dearly loved the game of cards, which led him, especially in later years, into frequent and unpleasant skirmishes with Varvara Petrovna, particularly as he was always losing. But of that later. 
I will only observe that he was a man of tender conscience, that is, sometimes, and was so often depressed. In the course of his twenty years' friendship with Varvara Petrovna, he used regularly, three or four times a year, to sink into a state of patriotic grief, as it was called among us, or rather really into an attack of spleen. But our estimable Varvara Petrovna preferred the former phrase. Of late years his grief had begun to be not only patriotic, but at times alcoholic too, but Varvara Petrovna Lortness succeeded in keeping him all his life from trivial inclinations, and he needed someone to look after him indeed, for he sometimes behaved very oddly. In the midst of his exalted sorrow he would begin laughing like any simple peasant. There were moments when he began to take a humorous tone, even about himself, but there was nothing Varvara Petrovna dreaded so much as a humorous tone. She was a woman of the classic type, a female Massinus, invariably guided only by the highest considerations. The influence of this exalted lady over her poor friend for twenty years is a fact of the first importance. I shall need to speak of her more particularly, which I now proceed to do. <laughs>